Hey, my good friends, Sam Haymart for Test Driven TV. I've been spending the week with the 2017 Mazda MX-5 RF. RF meaning retractable fixed roof here. Now, it's not the standard convertible, a car I've driven and I've loved more than once. This has a bit of a hard top, but it's not the standard hard top either. It actually operates quite a bit differently, more of a Targa. So in my week with it, I've really got a chance to relive my driving enjoyment with the car, but also find out what that top, what it's like to live with. The latest generation Mazda MX-5 is obviously quite different from the previous generation. Its styling is far more modern, much more angular, and they really sort of pushed the envelope when they redesigned it for this generation. And on my first test drive, which is linked at the end, uh, that's what I said. I said, you know, this car drives wonderful, the engine's great, it's fun to drive and live with. I'd buy it, but I'd have to get used to that styling. And that's, that's something that I think has happened now. I've gotten used to the styling. I really do like it. I like the angular headlights, the way they cut into the nose here. I like the creases along the hood, down the side and around the back. It's just very artistic, sort of an origami fold work going on there in the overall styling theme. Now, the RF here comes in two trim grades, the Club and the Grand Touring, which I've got right here. And of course, Grand Touring here means that I've got the nicer wheels. These are the dark satin finished 17 inch alloy wheels. And they're not all the way to black, which is good because I'm not really a fan of the black wheels, although I know they're very popular out there. This is a nice middle ground for me because um, they still have a little bit of flash to them. Now the thing that really separates the RF from the standard MX-5 Miata convertible, obviously, is this top. And so what we have here is what appears to be a hard top MX-5. You've got a nice fastback roof line there that looks pretty sexy, I might say. At first, just like the styling of the original car, it didn't quite set well with me. But now, especially looking at it from the rear three-quarter view, I really do like it. Now what you've got here is you've got a rear section and a center section here. The center section is actually what goes away when you press that button to lower the top. So it takes about 13 seconds, the rear section lifts up in the air, and then the center section and the rear glass stow down underneath. Then, that rear section goes back down. Once the top is stowed, what you see here essentially is a Targa top. The big difference here is that the rear glass is also stowed away, so you've got airflow going through there, and therefore, you've also got the wind deflector there between the seats, which you might expect to find on a traditional convertible, but as you can see, a traditional convertible, this isn't. The interior of the MX-5 is a place that's got a lot of good and bad, just as I spoke of in my previous reviews of this car, as well as the Fiat 124 Spider, which is identical here. Let's get the good out of the way first, so you don't think I'm just banging on this car unnecessarily. First of all, the material quality here is very, very good. It's classic Japanese material quality here on the interior. And I like this particular trim color that I have here. I've got tan with black, some piano black trims here and there. It's very appealing to the eye, especially with this bright red body color trim in here. I love the way it looks. Now sitting here behind the wheel, finding my position wasn't too difficult for me, but I'm average size 5'9", and the steering wheel does have a tilt adjustment, but not a telescope. Something to remember when you get in this car, because this seat does not have a lot of adjustment range. This is a two-seater. Once these seats go all the way back, they don't go back further. You can't recline them back further because they're up against a wall there. And in this case, I'm not all the way back with the seat, not the lower cushion, but the back is all the way back so that my arms are in a good relation to the steering wheel. So if you're a larger person, sit in this car and spend some time in it uh, before you buy. And that is the other thing here. These seats are reasonably comfortable for short drives. I spent a few days, 78 hours behind the wheel, and after a long time in these seats, boy, at the end of the day, I wanted to get out of them. They're, they're seats that are really good for a short day on a windy road because they hold you really, really well. But um, on long, long trips, uh, they can get to be a little bit, well, you want to get out of them at the end of the day. Let's just leave it at that. So controls in here, switch gear, pretty good quality. Here on the steering wheel, you've got all the controls that you could ask for for the trip computer as well as the audio controls. 
The instrument cluster on this car is actually unique to the RF, a little bit different than the convertible, at least for this year. It has a TFT display over on the left dial that allows you to customize the information sets that you have. And I presume they'll probably roll that into the convertible 2018 model year or sometime beyond. That is a Mazda corporate cluster that, that we have here, just like a lot of the parts and pieces in this car. And that gets us to uh, some of the complaints that I have about this interior. And we'll start with storage. Now this is a sports car, it's not expected that it's going to have minivan like storage, but we'll start with down here on the console, there's a slot for your phone which actually uh, holds a pretty good sized phone down there, mine fits in it no problem, there's USB ports right there next to it, and an auxiliary port. Here I've got a little spot here which is perfect for sunglasses, and not sunglasses in a case mind you, but sunglasses will fit down there. The glove box, back here behind you not very big either it's just large enough for the owner's manual that's in there and maybe a couple of other things a pair of gloves perhaps and if you have the cd player it's right here not a very easy place to get to and that's the thing that really sort of gets to the ergonomic design of this interior. There's a lot of parts, bin pieces, and bits here. Uh, if you get into a lot of Mazdas, you'll see a lot of familiar things. And so it seems like when they designed this interior, they designed it around existing parts rather than designed an interior with a clean sheet of paper. And that goes to things like the 12-volt port. Now these USB ports that are here, they didn't have enough power to charge my phone during the course of a day. My phone actually went dead even though it was plugged in and charging because the power it was using was greater than the power those things could offer. So 12 volt port, you use an adapter. No brainer, right? Well, where's the 12 volt port? It's down here under the dash, up under the footwell. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. It's underneath the footwell. You can't even reach it from the driver's seat. You have to get on the ground over there on the side and get up under the dash to plug anything into it. And it's just vexing because this is a brand new car designed from the ground up. Why they couldn't design it to put a 12 volt port somewhere, anywhere than up there, bizarre. That's just bizarre. But that gets to other things too that are design overlooks like these cup holders. Cup holder there. Now these are removable. You can take them out and put them anywhere. Um, this is the easiest one to reach if you're the driver, but if you've got a friend sitting here, they're gonna smash their knee into it. They're not gonna want you to have that cup holder. The other place to have them is right back here. You can put both here or just one. Problem is, if you're driving, often you bump your elbow into it just shifting gears. And more importantly, the infotainment system here depends on this knob down here and these buttons. And to be able to reach these things, you have to sort of get like this because you, the cup holders are in the way. There's just so many ways they could have designed this better, I think. And I've said that before, and I hate to belabor it. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, the interior overall, it just it's a mix of good and bad. It's beautiful to look at. It can be comfortable up to a point. Um, but when it comes to practicality, even though it is a sports car, I do think they could have done a better job. So the interior gets three out of five stars. Now, having just complained about the interior quite a bit, we've got to talk about this infotainment system. And if you've watched any review I've ever done with a Mazda, you know what's coming here because this is truly, and I hate to say this, I hate to beat up on something, this is truly the worst infotainment system in any brand out there right now. And the reason is because we've got a screen up here and then we've got a control puck down here on the center console. Now, we already talked about the ergonomic issues trying to use that. But the problem with Mazda is that stops being a touchscreen the moment this car starts rolling. Why? There's no other car company on this planet that stops you from using the touchscreen just because you're driving. And so what happens is instead of being able to touch things right here on the screen and navigate that menu in a sensible way that's easier, you're forced to use this knob, this puck, other knobs and these buttons down here. And it's quite frankly difficult. These menus on this are two or three layers deep for any single thing you want to do. Changing stations, storing a preset, getting to your presets, doing any other setting there is. It takes two or three twists and bumps and presses just to do anything here. And it's just vexing because as you're going down the road, it's so much safer to do that than it is to do this. Okay, so why Mazda does that, I just, I don't get it at all. The other thing is it's missing a lot of features that you'd expect at this price, or any price for that matter. It does not have Apple CarPlay. It does not have Android Auto. Um, so there's a lot of improvement to be made here. The good news is the Bose audio backend sounds absolutely great. 
you're just going to go bald trying to set it and set it up. And look, I know a lot of you folks out there that own Mazdas or you drive these cars, you might say, Sam, you're just, you're complaining too much. No, I drive a lot of different brands cars. The bottom line is that every other car brand out there has made this work in such a way that it doesn't drive me bonkers. And so I know that once you get used to a car, you get used to it. It doesn't make it better than the next car. They have a lot of improvement to make here. And even though the audio is very good, this is still a three out of five star system. What's under the hood of the Mazda MX-5 RF is the same engine you're going to find in the standard Miata, and that's the two-liter four-cylinder engine, 155 horsepower, 148 pound-feet of torque. Here, I've got the six-speed manual transmission in lieu of the automatic, which actually does get better fuel economy than this, but this one still does very well, rated at 26 MPG city, 33 MPG highway, and 26 MPG combined. So the big question I always ask is, how does it go? chirp out of those tires there at 60. So 155 horsepower isn't going to win a lot of races, but the great news, the great news here is the fact that this engine wants to please you. It revs out so freely. It has a wonderful sound. It has a wonderful personality. It makes you want to roll it through the gears. You cannot say that for the Scion, I mean the Toyota 86. You can't say that. A car has a very noisy, rough, nasty engine that you just don't want to rev out. This one, it's fun. You want to rev it out because it's got a great sound. There's a lot of prize when you get to the end of that rev range. And you get a little bit of a kick in the back because it's got a torque curve. So even though it's not the fastest car on the planet, yes, it could use another 50 or so horsepower. It's pleasant. The other great thing is it gets pretty good fuel economy. It's rated at 29 mpg. That's exactly what I got with it during my week of driving, which was actually tilted a little bit more towards city than highway. So I'm very impressed with this powertrain, just as I was the last couple times I've driven it. Powertrain, it's five out of five stars. The first thing you notice about this car when you get out on the highway up to speed is the fact that it's pretty noisy in here, to be honest with you. This isn't nearly as quiet, uh, nearly as calm with the top down as the standard convertible is. And that's because obviously we've got this structure back here which is catching the wind. So you've got buffeting and you've got wind noise. And it's particularly more noticeable when you have crosswinds. So that's the big change as far as riding in it and driving in it from the standard convertible is that you still get the sun that's going to sunburn you, but it's just a little bit noisier. So. It's really more about the styling element that you're going to get out of this thing. You're not getting a different environment in here, at least not a better one, I don't think. The other thing to point out here is that we're still in a convertible when it comes to the structure, which means we have cowl shake here because that's not a roof structure. It's just a decorative element back there. So if you're seeing a little bit of shutter there in our picture, it's because that's cowl shake. That camera is actually attached to the windshield. So there's that. The great thing is the handling and the ride Every bit as good as the standard Miata convertible. The steering, the chassis, absolutely one of the best in the business. There are few cars, if any, out there that offer this blend of rear wheel drive fun, this light responsiveness, and the refinement that this car has for the money, let alone any price. So chassis, just like the regular convertible, gets five out of five stars. <laughs> I love it. On the measure of quality, this is built in Hiroshima, Japan, just like the last Miata we drove and the Fiat 124 Spider I drove just last year. And the quality really is impeccable. It's iconic of the Japanese legend when it comes to quality. It's body fit and finish, it's paint, it's interior fit. Everything is just very well put together, save for a couple rattles and squeaks when you really hit those big bumps. So quality is five out of five stars. All right, my friends, wrapping it up for the Mazda MX-5 RF. Just as fun as the standard MX-5 convertible, just as good in handling, just as good in the overall performance aspects. The interior, the infotainment system, just the same. I rated them just the same in the standard convertible uh, and 
you know, what are you going to do? I mean, they need improvement. There's no question about it. But even then, they don't spoil the car for me. Now, it doesn't make the I'd buy it list because I just, I honestly, I couldn't live with that with that infotainment system. That is a deal killer for me personally, but a lot of people uh, aren't as OCD about those little details as I am. This is a great little car, and at this price, $33,000 and some change, I think it's a great value. Even at 31, where you get into the club, uh, still a lot of features. It's a great little car for the money. It's hard to find anything for the price that beats it in terms of fun to drive and overall quality. It's just a tough package to beat. So I put value here at five out of five stars. When you put that in with everything we've already talked about, including the interior and the infotainment system, we're at four and a half stars for the review. Still very good. I'm Sam Haymar for Test Driven TV. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed that test drive because I sure did. This is a wonderful car to drive and live with every day. Now, I have a test drive on the standard convertible. You can see that by clicking right there on the big square. I actually took it up on a windy mountain road, really exercised the handling and the performance, and you can really get a feel for that there. Otherwise, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking right there on the round logo. Either way, stay tuned.